welcome to Goat Chats. My name is Brittany Sweeney and I am the Communications Manager for the Livestock Conservancy. I'm so glad that you could join us today for our second edition of Goat Chats. We're celebrating all things goat since it's Goattober after all. It's one of my favorite months. I hope it's one of your favorite as well. Um, with me today will be Renard Turner. He is having just a little bit of technical difficulties, but he will be joining us as soon as he can. We're super excited to have him on the show. He is from Vanguard Ranch, where they raise myotonic goats. Those are listed as recovering on the conservation priority list. Let's see, I think he's here with us right now. Hi, Renard, how are you? I am good. It, it did go dark for a moment there, kind of took my breath away, but I'm back. Let's see how. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that you're here today. We are live. Okay. Um, I'm happy to be here and I'm thankful for the opportunity to share some uh, goat info with you. Absolutely. I am just going to remind everyone real quickly to leave us a comment or a question on Facebook and let us know you're here and what you want to talk about, any questions that you may have. After the chat, we'll get to those. I know it's my favorite part. Everybody inst uh, has the most interesting questions. We learn so many things. So we'll be getting to those real soon. Um, Renard, do you want to tell us a little bit more about Vanguard Ranch and what you do there and how you got started with goats? Sure. I actually got started quite by accident, uh, like I imagine many people do. I was actually at a <clears throat> at a horse show, and um, in 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 the brochure for the horses was a very interesting article about meat goats and <clears throat> how there weren't enough in this country to supply the domestic need. So I had experience with raising sheep before, but I went back home and researched goats decided it would be a good fit for our farm. We're all sustainable and organic. And, you know, I like those creatures with these low carbon footprints and goats were a perfect fit for what we wanted to do. Um, we had more forage that was based on forbs and trees and shrubs than we did pasture. So it wasn't not ideal for sheep. We opted for goats. So my process of getting to the myotonics was a little bit long. I started with other breeds of goats, which I I'm sure Renard will be right back. Sometimes the role air in the net can be a little difficult, a little challenging, um, but we'll get that figured out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of crazy. They put a repeater right here on the farm. Um, well, we shouldn't be having any issues, but uh, I'm back. So we started with the uh, myotonics. Um, when I did some research and it led me to the Livestock Conservancy and uh, Dr. Phil Sponnenberg. He was my original source for my breeding stock. I learned a lot from him and we were very pleased with the goats. So when I bought two bucks from him, I had another breed of goat on the farm. My wife liked the myotonics better. She thought they were cuter, they were a little smaller, the bucks weren't as aggressive, but I had them for a couple of years and didn't even use them. Um, we just kept them separate from our other purebred stock. Um, after about four or five years, I needed to put in another buck. We put in a myotonic buck and the kids that we had were so much better than the previous stock that, you know, the light goes off in your head and it's like, aha. Uh -huh. And since we, we have a food concession business and we have our goats processed and we turn them into goat burgers and curry goat and goat kebabs. Well, my processor said to me, he said, you know, Mr. Turner, don't bring me those skinny goats anymore. Bring me these guys. And those were half myotonic at the time. So we did the usual breeding up and then I got more purebred does and we have not looked back. They have been a perfect fit for our farm. These goats do wonderful on a forage base. Um, we don't really have improved pastures. We have native pastures and they do fine. They're great mothers. They I'm sure Renard will be right back. Um, so we can learn a little bit more about his awesome myotonic goats. Yes. And um, I hope that doesn't happen again. It's going to be one of those days. I can hear you just fine. You're doing fantastic. Okay. okay. You're telling us about how awesome myotonic goats are. So, so what happened was, you know, from these two bucks that we got from Dr. Phil Sponnenberg, who's a great guy. Um, wonderful. Man, yeah, I learned so much and I, I visited his farm and that's where I picked up my stock. So we kind of got, 
I wouldn't say crazy about myotonics, but we were like very encouraged by the quality of our, of the kids. And we started having more um, product to sell um, because they were meteor. And not only were they meteor, they were more thrifty and we had less problems with everything related to raising goats. So we were sold on these guys. And then I decided to, you know, really go for it because I like genetics and let's line breed and inbreed to a standard and try to get a little bit faster growth out of them, maybe a little bit more thickness, but that's, you know, what most breeders do, right? We're trying to improve the breed. So we went on a breed improvement um, trajectory. He'll be right back. It's going to be one of those days and that's okay. Everybody has one. And I'm just going to keep my finger on this button. <laughs> I'm just going to keep readmitting you back in. It's great. <laughs> okay. Um, you were telling well, us so, about your line breeding program. Right. So I started with um, one buck in particular, solid black, thick and meaty. We got from Dr. Phil Sponenberg. We called him Magic Man. And we noticed that Magic Man, every dough we put him on, you know, he added this thickness to them. But the thing that we really liked about him was his, his temperament. You know, he was not this fiery guy who was difficult to manage. He was easy to handle. He didn't need his hoofs trimmed. Um, and he was really a thick set guy. Um, that sold us on him. So I kept his sons. And even to this day, I'm line breeding back to his sons and grandson. And, um, but I am picking up another buck from my, my doctor, Phil, Dr. Phil Sponenberg, um, probably later this month, because I will infuse that genetics into our herd as well and then back cross to some of the grandchildren of the original magic man and, and the doe that we bred him to, which we named Queen. Bernard will be right back. Um, we will be having Dr. Phil Spinenberg on at the end of the month. If you want to tune in then, he will be joining us for uh, Ask Anything About Goats. Yes. So we're back. Oh, welcome back, yes. Um, you know, I, I hope it's not this Ethernet cord here, but it shouldn't be. It's uh, Everything's brand new. The cord's been new, but I haven't used it. I've always just used the Wi-Fi for Zoom, and it works pretty seamlessly. But anyway, here we are, 21st century magic. Um, so these goats, um, we're still breeding the progeny from Magic Man and, and Queen. Those genetics are throughout our herd. We've infused a few other does um, from other herds who raise goats similarly to ourselves, which is all natural. Um, you know, we're not graining these animals. Um, we hardly have any medical problems. Um, we use all natural remedies whenever possible, but we have so few problems. It's just, um, it's as easy as it's ever been. And we'll be right back. <laughs> um, so yes, if you have questions or comments, the things, you know, please let us know, leave us. I was saying I've okay. raised Kiko goats. I've read, yeah, I've raised Kikos, boars, Spanish, a couple of different strains of Spanish and various crosses of all of those goats. But of all of the goats that we've raised on our farm, the myotonics work the best for us um, and, and we're sticking with them. And, and I, I do like conserving them. You know, it's, it's really, it makes you feel good. You know, there's, there's not a whole lot of them around, but we're trying to breed a better meat goat for commercial purposes with our myotonic based herd they're a perfect fit they just work well for us here we're in central virginia um moderate rainfall although the last year we had a lot but i, I don't have worming problems generally um our biggest nemesis i think in this area is that meningeal worm but you know, there's not a whole lot we can do about that um but as far as thriftiness all of our does are selected for twinning and some have triplets, of course, but as long as they twin, I'm fine with that. Uh, they're really exceptionally good mothers. Um, we, we selected Queen, the queen of our herd, because she was so aggressive against our, the livestock guarding dogs that, uh, you know, they didn't have a chance if they got close to her, her kids. You know, she would fight them off. And I find that to be something that I find very attractive in a herd. I want that in my does. It's really a strong maternal trait. Sure. So... Uh, we're, we're enjoying them. They, they just work well for us. I think more people should raise them, but uh, they do grow a little slower than most other breeds, which is a known factor. But the inputs are so much lower, significantly lower, 
that for a producer, it's it's a wash. You know, I'd rather have them for an extra two or three months, but you know, I'm a value added producer. And Bernardo will be right back. Uh, we'll continue talking about these awesome myotonic goats. He's got a special name for him, so we'll ask him about that. I don't know why it's buffering. It's technology. It's, you know, when you need it, it doesn't work, but, you know, it's always something. It's okay. I'll push the button and bring it back. Okay. So, but they, they're really nice goats. I think that one of the major advantages is that they're easy keepers. They're thrifty on forage. We are a forage based operation. You know, there was a book I read many years ago by, um, Sylvia Tomlinson called the meat goats of Caston Creek and a line in that book made me really think it said which came first the goat or the feed store well obviously the goat came first but that was an aha moment and I said to myself hmm you know these trips to the feed store and this long feed bill and all these different supplements and so forth that were giving these goats may not be the right way to do this and that put me on the quest to finding this all natural goat. So we coined the term Bangus and Bangus is an acronym for the best all natural goat in the United States. Our goats work in the field. They're not goats that we walk around in a show ring. We keep them all natural. We rarely have to trim hoofs. We rarely have to worm. We rarely have any kind of problems. I don't have to pull kids. Uh, the mothers nurse twins easily on their own. Uh, Bernard will be right back. Um, during the meantime, you can check out his awesome Facebook page at Vanguard Ranch Meat Goats after their chat, of course. Yep. Okay, so I'm ready to listen to you. <laughs> what, <laughs> what else would you like to hear, Brittany? <laughs> I love the name Bangos. I think that's fantastic. What a great name for your goats. They sound amazing. Um, that's very, very cool. Um, yeah. I'm really looking forward to this next generation, too, because when I roll in this other buck, then I'll have does that are bred to him. I'll keep a son, probably, and then I'll cross those two lines. But I'll still be line breeding back to the originals. And and that's how we keep it straight and keep it, you know, sturdy, healthy, strong and, and working for us. It's, it makes it a lot of fun. Absolutely. That's important. So you were talking a little bit about your all natural forage and pasture. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? What's what's the best pasture for your goats? Because they work hard. Yeah the, yeah, the pasture, I, you know, we've taken time to build this thing naturally. First of all, I'm a hardcore naturalist. And I think that the best forage is that which is provided for us by the creator in our environment that we live in. So I would not go out and try to plant like monocrop, just one thing, a mix of weeds and forbs and Grasses and herbs is best for these goats. Um, they like shrubs. I, I don't keep them out of the wood line. I've actually fenced in part of the woods so they can do their thing. But the only two things that I have added to my pasture, actually three over the years, is um, Cerecia lespediza, which is great for the anthelmintic properties, great for the goats, and uh, forest forage chicory. I used a Puna variety forage chicory, and it persisted for about three to five years until you know, I Bernard will be right back. We'll continue to talk about his awesome natural pasture for goats. Um, until then, please leave us some comments and questions. We'll get to those very soon. Here we are again. It just you're back. <laughs> I'm back. It's magic. Um, <laughs> Cerecia lespediza and um, forage chicory and uh, cereal rye grass. I, those are the only things I've ever added to the pastures here. Everything else is 100% native. And, and that's the way we want it because I don't think it's necessary to put in all of these soil amendments to try to change the nature of the place you're living in. I think it's best to find what works there. It takes patience though. You know, I've been on this property here about 20 years now and you know, our, our, our fields are lush and, and, and self-regenerating, you know, but we've got the right bacteria in the soil and everything to make it work really well for us. And I'm kind of a student of like that Elaine Ingham school, you know, of uh, mycorrhizal bacteria. You let, let it, nature will show you what you need. You just have to be patient. I don't try to change it. I'm more of a student and an observer of nature. And um, it works. 
And, and that's why I'm not changing anything. The only th uh, thing that we do, we use an organic um, loose mineral for our goats and we have automatic waterers and we have livestock guardian dogs. We use Akbosh um, livestock guardian dogs because there's coyotes around us. I've seen one red, red wolf, but I've seen several coyotes handle that for us. So, um, you know, we try to keep it real simple and um, goats do work for us. And I can't see this farm without goats. They're enhancing the farm, increasing the value of it by, you know, fertilizing as they clear. Otherwise, I'd have a lot more work to do with, the, you know, a tractor and a bush hog, which I don't really want to do. Understandable. Let them do the work for you. Yes, absolutely. And, and regenerate it as they go. Plus, you know, it's, it's nice to be preserving something. I'm, I'm really excited about the livestock conservancy. I've, I've been a student of agriculture for many years. And, you know, besides goats, I have an interest in horses, you know, particular Spanish colonial horses. And we, we've also raised sheep here before, caracals. It's a rare breed. Don't have them anymore. I've also raised horned dorset sheep and even ostrich. So we've Bernard will be right back. We'll continue to talk about all the wonderful animals that he is raising on his farm naturally. Um, if you've got questions, go ahead and leave them for us. We'll get to those very soon. Back again. You're back. You know, what, what, you know the, the irony of this is when I tried this like three days ago and I plugged it in and checked the microphone tech and everything worked just fine. And I'm like, oh, this is a piece of cake. It's going to be fine. But uh, it's always when it's live. It's making me scratch my head a bit today, but that's okay. Is it a loose connection to your computer? You no, know, I'm, I'm, I'm right here and it's everything's connected and I've directly into the router. We, we are in a rural area, so I'm on this like a Verizon Cantena uh, router and I'm plugged directly in and directly into the laptop. And I usually don't use the direct connection. I usually just go Wi-Fi, but sure. because it said it's better to go direct, I went direct this time. Maybe it's just not used to it, <laughs> but yeah, that's okay. We're connection might be camera shy, you know. <laughs> yeah, whatever. But I can see and hear you, so that's that's all good. That's what's uh, important. So you were telling she used to raise ostriches as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we tried ostrich for a while. That, that was a mistake. <laughs> you know, you farming can teach you lessons in life as you go. That that was a definite lesson that we learned. They were um. Besides being downright honorary, the rooster would, would try to kill me when I went in. So that oh, was no. not a, a very pleasant experience to do no. with an animal that wanted to stomp you into the ground every other day. <laughs> that sounds very unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> so they're gone. No more ostrich. Absolutely. Um, I saw something on your Facebook that was about how goats fit into sustainable food habits. And I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. When you come back, obviously. <laughs> uh, yes, can you know afterward check out uh, Renard's website. He's got all sorts of wonderful things there. Yeah, so I find goats to be a perfect fit because they have a low carbon footprint, and that's very important. We need we need to we need to be very mindful of that. Um, you know, I, I do believe that global warming is not a hoax. Um, they require less inputs, less feed, and all of the resources associated with raising animals. I'm not a proponent of factory farming anyway, but for those folks who are, you know, goats do not lend themselves well to that. And I think that's a good thing. Um, so the main reason that, that I like them, and like I said, is because they have that low carbon footprint. They give back more than they take. So a doe that will twin consistently, say over a six or eight year period has really been a super producer. Um, that's a good thing. They help to clear the land by removing vegetation that other critters don't necessarily eat. And it actually improves the, the, the value of your property as, as they graze it. You know, they reach up and they clear part of the understory. It lets in more light that encourages new vegetation, new microbes, insects, everything. So I, I think they are really a land enhancing as long as, as long as, and this is the big caveat, as long as they're not overcrowded, put into situations that where they're overgrazed or damp, you know, don't keep them in wet areas. Don't overcrowd them. You know, the most things I say that I read say you can stock, you know, well, depending up to like five goats in their kids per acre. 
I like to use the number three simply because I never want to be overcrowded. And I'm not a greedy person, so I'd rather. Bernard will be right back. And we'll continue talking about sustainable food habits and how goats fit into those. And then we'll get to your questions. Yeah, as Welcome I was back. saying, yeah, I'd rather have healthy animals that are happy. Um, uh, the biggest challenges that we've had, as many people do, is uh, is fencing, you know, and I've got a mix of fencing on the farm from um, um, five high tensile electric. And I, I do like electric for goats because they're smart and they, as long as you keep it hot and have it grounded well, they get a good shock. They pretty much stay off it. The problem is when you have a rainy season and you've got a long fence line, and you've got to weed whack it. I don't use chemical sprays, so I've got to go along and weed whack it and torch it and burn it um, to keep that vegetation from grounding out and reducing my um, electrical charge. And I've got combinations of that and uh, the non-climb goat and sheep fence. And I'm, I'm switching to using more of that, all of that on the perimeter of the farm because if we have storms and trees fall down, that's a real pain to have to go back there and cut the trees off and so forth and so on. Um, Goats just climb up the tree and, you know, go for a little hike. But That's right. fortunately, ours come back. You know, my wife can call them. I can call them. And, you know, they've been a quarter of a mile or more away sometimes after a storm. But they, they generally come back right about the same time every day if they're out. So we don't worry about that as much as we used to because we've learned that they're quite smart and they actually like home and know how to get back. And we don't stress as much as we used to. But you know, the main reasons that I think goats fit in into is particularly sustainable um, agriculture and, and homesteading is that they are going to get. Don't worry, he'll be right back. Um, so, yes, please check out Renard's website and check out his Facebook. After after the chat today, of course. There yes. you are. Oh, uh, yes. It's another one of those moments this little twilight zone here or something it's all my green lights are on and it's working just fine and then it goes oh are you having a problem i'm like no i wasn't but now i am but okay the case so of back. the monday is on tuesday <laughs> yeah yeah you're telling us about fencing and it's very important yeah. with goats yes it is um high tensile electric is still my first choice because uh the ease of putting it up and also the cost factors however i will say this after having had goods for 10 plus years now, I'm I'm transitioning to non-climb sheep and goat with a hot, hot wire at the top on the perimeter and using the high tensile electric for cross fencing because I have had some does that for whatever reasons, man, they just, they'll take the shock. You know, I don't, oh, I don't no. know. There, there's a few of them that'll do that. Most of them don't. So I, I still advocate for high tensile electric, uh, is a cost saver and a labor saver. And there's lots of good options out there. Make sure that your grounding rods are in good. That's the biggest problem I see people having is that they don't put in adequate ground rods, you know, and you need adequate ground rods. I, leave, I use three for every one of my chargers and um, it'll knock me on my butt. So I think it stops most goats, but there's always. Bernard will be right back. And then We'll get to your questions. I think we've got a couple coming in. Yeah, there's there's always that one goat that likes to be an escape artist. And we have one, one doe. She happens to be my wife's favorite, so I can't get rid of her now. But she will stick her horns into real fencing or non-climb and rotate it back and forth and make a hole big enough to put her head through. And then she... One shoulder at a time, she climbs through and calls everybody else. And she she does this consistently. But <clears throat> my wife likes her, so she gets a pass. She gets to stay here. But I'm like, you know, I put cattle panels and I wired it in. She'll move 20 feet down and make another hole. She's a smart one. They're amazingly She's smart a sometimes. Well, the grill can take care of that if she keeps it up. <laughs> it's recycling. That's right. That's how you get rid of problems sometimes. <laughs> right. Do you have a right. favorite recipe that you like to use? Um, well, we have a family recipe. My mom um, lived with my wife and I for years. And we, when we started our, our mobile 
um, concession trailer, we did a couple of recipes. So we have these family recipes now that we keep in a box tucked away. So I can't share everything, but okay. it's all natural ingredients. Okay. It's all natural ingredients. There's no chemicals, there's no additives and people love it. And uh, I slow cook it very, I slow cook it and take, well, I take, I take a lot of time, you know, sometimes four, six hours, you know, to cook a product and we have everything um, deboned by hand. So there's not any gristle or anything in our curry. And we do quarter pound goat burgers. People love them. And we had food festivals at the farm. COVID changed all of that really because we, we, you don't have the crowds anymore. So we're going to have to rethink what we're going to do next. Um, I'll probably end up doing like a white tent pop up and invite people to the farm that way. So they can experience, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll have a real farm to table. Everything will come right from here. You can see where it came from. So you can find all sorts of things available from Renard on his website. Definitely wow. encourage you to check that out after today's chat. Um, Renard, do you have time okay. for questions from some of our uh, Yes, watchers? Yes, I'll, I'll be happy to. Excellent. Karina wants to I'll, know, I might, say what? If you can just- I might end up typing in case it flips off or whatever, but go yeah, ahead. Yeah, you could type it in the chat and I can read yeah. it if that happens. Uh, exactly. Karina wants to know if you can describe what line breeding is for folks who may not know what that is. You were talking about that a little bit earlier. Wait, can you repeat that, please? Sure. A line breeding? Is that uh, what, what, what is line breeding? Aha, uh -huh. okay. So uh, line breeding is when you take, well, I'll explain it the simplest way that I know how. If I have, if I start with one buck and one doe, the progeny that they have are their direct children. If I breed back to one of the parents, that's inbreeding. If I use line breeding, I'm using like brothers or, or sons of the father as my base breeding bucks so that all of my bucks are kin. So line breeding is a kinship breeding method where you concentrate on specific genetic um, phenotypes that you wish to have in your herd. So in my particular head, most of my goats are solid black or chocolate. You know, I have a few that have a few spots, but most of them are solid. I just prefer the solid color. Bernard will be right back to talk more about line breeding and what that is. Most, most of them are short haired. Um, I, I'm not really a fan of long haired goats. I don't even like, you know, long hair, you know, on their, on their legs. Um, and they have a particular ear pattern, which is common to myotonics, but in my herd is quite uniform because they are line bred back to an original pair that I started with. So line breeding differs from inbreeding. When inbreeding, you will breed animals that are more closely genetically related. Um, mother to son, father to daughter, brother to sister. That's breeding much closer than line breeding. Line breeding, you will breed uncles, nephews, grandfathers, granddaughters, uh, but you're breeding for a specific phenotype, a specific physical type that you want to maintain, plus, you know, the genotype, typical stuff that you can't see, but it's for conformity. And, and that's really how all, all the modern breeds were developed. Any, anything that's recognizable as a breed was, at some point in time, line bred and inbred to fix the genetic traits. I hope that Oh, that was great. Good. Thank you. Thank you for asking that sure. question, Karina. Let's see. Erin Link says she's working on improving soil as well. She thinks it is important to know what works best in your region as well. Um, no till, no till then chicory this spring, as well as some grass and plantain. No till then chicory. This. Okay. Okay. As well as. Oh, Aaron. Hey, Aaron. I followed. I've seen her her stuff on Facebook before, as well as some grass and plantain. I'm worsening. I'm pretty sure as well. I think it is important to know what's. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I'm in total agreement with that. I've seen Aaron. She's doing some work with sheep. I think you got um, Saint Croix or Barbados out there. Am I correct? I don't know. She can type. Aaron, type back yeah. in and let us know what kind of sheep. I know she's got San Clemente Island goats. Um, yeah, yeah, I've seen some of her stuff on. 
case we've chatted before, but that's spot on. Now, the forage chicory, here's what I thought, and the reason I used it, and I used a particular variety called Puna, P-U-N-A, forage chicory. I'll probably put it back in again. Um, you know, I, when I rotated my goats out of that, it persisted for like about five years, but, you know, I, I moved too many goats onto that one field, and I think they ate it down, and then we had a couple of dry seasons, and it didn't really come back like it should have, but it works great. Um, yeah, so I, I'm in concert with your thinking. It is important to know what works best in your region. You don't want to try to do what somebody's doing in Wisconsin or Minnesota and replicate that on your farm in the southeast region. So nature is going to tell you, let nature be your guide for what works best for you. And where a deer can survive, really a goat should be able to survive as well. You know. That's very true. Thanks, Aaron, for letting us know about your San Clemente Island goats. I think I remember seeing them on Facebook earlier. I think it's EB Ranch. You should check out some of her stuff. It's pretty great as well. Got it, Aaron. It's San Clemente Island goats. I remember now. I saw the pictures. Good luck with them. They were interesting. I, I find them interesting as well. Um, and they need to be preserved, so you're spot on. I think you're doing it right with compassion and caring. Bravo. Thanks for tuning in today, Aaron, and sending some questions comments let's see becky says these goats sound like our experience with our catadin sheep agreed it's a pain to keep weeds at bay on the electric fence we love the no climb yeah so i have found and, and I, I used to raise sheep before i didn't mention that but i did raise horn dorsets for i don't know four or five years um really like them you know again we were um, I like the older genetics and we had the little short squatty, well not little, thick squatty, big horn dorsets. They were great for market, you know, for hothouse lambs. But the problem was I couldn't find a decent person to shear them and that became a problem. So we got out of the sheep and into the goats. And of course the goats are doing much better on our farm because we didn't really have a, a forage base on grass that was what the sheep needed, whereas the goats are much more flexible. So. Yeah, I see that Aaron has the San Clemente and uh, got it. Thanks, Becky. Yeah, Becky, have, have you tried, um, oh man, you know, sheep are just, because of the wool is an insulator, it's a little bit more difficult, but you find the hottest charger you can find. I, I went with the Zavara brand uh, years ago and I'm still using them and they are pretty hot. <laughs> It's, it's all about the grounding, though, and, and training them. And I hope it doesn't click me off here again, but okay. Still holding on strong. Let's see. We've got yeah. another question from Erin. She says she may have missed it at the beginning, but do you kid on pasture? Um, Bernard, I'll be right back to talk about this question. If... What was that question, Erin? She wanted to know, do you kid on pasture? And also personally seeing more native plants and specifically birds coming into pastures, I have my goats rotating hmm. on. Absolutely I do. Um, I don't do any jugs on the farm. All of my does will kid naturally in the field. They choose where they want to kid. Um, you know, they usually just walk away um, and, and we like it like that. I don't force them. I don't jug them at all. I select for maternals that don't need that. That's just more work than I need to be doing. So yes, we do get on pasture and yeah, birds. I'm a bird person too. So we, we like to have lots of birds around here. We have a lot of cowbirds last year. I noticed there was a, a big increase in cowbirds, but not as many bluebirds, you know, but um, yeah, our, our goats totally kid on pasture. There, our goats are never locked up, so they have run-in sheds. They can. Aaron, thanks for asking such great questions. We'll be right back to finish talking about kidding on pasture. Um, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna complain to Verizon. I've got all this unlimited stuff here, and I'm paying all this money for it. It shouldn't be doing this, but that's another story. I'll take care of that after this. But anyway. Um, Okay, what's the next one? Uh, let's see. We do we do kid on pasture. Our goats are, are never locked up. 
they're free range all the time. They can walk around and do whatever they want to do. We do have um, um, automatic waters um, and free choice mineral. I use a free choice mineral from a countryside naturals, organic um, loose goat mineral with kelp and diatomaceous earth and redmond trace minerals and salt. We find that's really it. And, and they, they do fine on that. In the winter, I get some round bales from my neighbor. I can just drive over to his farm and bring it back with my tractor and they'll be on forage. I have used um, corn gluten pellets before. I learned that from Dr. Phil and, um, and a little bit of cracked corn in the winter if it's like really cold, but I'm not big on graining these guys at all, but I'm not gonna let them suffer. If it's really cold and they've kitted, you know, you gotta help the mom out and keep her calories up so she can. Absolutely. So Renard will be right back. I think we've got a couple more questions. Welcome back. Got some typing and answer. Okay, bingo. Okay, uh, should just keep my finger. Okay, let's go for it. <laughs> all right, I think, thank you, Erin, for all your great questions and tuning in today. We have another one from Lauren. She says, hi, Renard, good to see you. She visited Vanguard on the MD small farm tour. Is that Mary? Okay. Um, she says your goat burger was excellent. Yes, thank you. We, we do hear that a lot from people. And, you know, we our motto is, you know, eat good, get horny. <laughs> That's a good motto. Um, but we, we thank you for that. The, the recipe has not changed. And I'm looking forward to uh, making more of them this summer, as well as, um, you know, bringing more people back to the farm. I think we're going to try to do something once a month, you know, and keep it small due to COVID. You know, I don't know, maybe at 10, 15 people, whatever, and, and set up the food truck and serve a, everything fresh from the farm. I think that's that's how we're going to move forward with this. But I appreciate that comment, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in today and letting us know and sending a great testimonial. I think that's all the questions that have come in. Um, so what is your most favorite thing about raising goats on your farm? Do you have a favorite? Um, that's a tough one, but I, I think, you know, I, I really like the genetics part and seeing improvements, you know, even though they may be incremental that I'm making from generation to generation. You know, we're, we're still striving for this, you know, this really uniformity um, and consistent um, um, weight gain. That's, you know, that's important. A lot of people, you know, we get the EPDs and, and all of that. I used to be really big into that. But now, you know, what I learned from my food, my processor was, you know what? Renardo will be right back. Just wanted to remind everyone that his goats are always free ranged, and that is important. Um, okay, so when when what my processor taught me was um, that when you're when the carcass is hanging at the end of the day, what makes the difference is how many pounds you're able to produce with the least amount of inputs, that's where the myotonics really shine. That, that's why I, I feel no need to, to deviate from them. Um, what I enjoy most is selecting for those animals that um, gain weight um, remarkably well um, and not, a, not an incredibly fast growth rate, but you know, I'm, I'm seeking that moderation, but I enjoy seeing the progress that I make from generation to generation. And then when I have an exceptional kid that comes out, you know, then I will hold that animal back and I, and I will line breed to that animal because I want to fix those traits in my herd. And, and I find that the does are really super important. So we, we prize the does, you know, even more so than the bucks, tell you the truth, because if you don't have a good mama, the rest of it's not going to go too good for you. Um, these, these goats are special, but I will breed to the bucks because I want the size, but the efficiency, the increased um, growth rate, that's what gets me excited. 
and then they're just pretty to look at. You know, my wife and I, she talks to them every day. You know, we, 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 the goats are just fun. That sounds really rewarding. We've got a couple yeah, it, more it, questions. It, sure. Um, let's see. Scott wants to know if you need to separate the bucks if you are milking. Um, he heard that that will make the milk taste bad. Bernard will be right back to answer your question, Scott. Uh huh. Good question, Scott. Do I separate the bucks? That's what you're going to be asking me here, right? And will it yes. make the milk taste bad? Okay. So first of all, you know, I'll say first we only we only do meat goats. So, um, but to answer your question, I will separate the buck links from their mothers, you know, like post weaning. I leave the daughters with their mothers and I'll tell you exactly why I do this. I leave the daughters with the mothers because I think that there's a maternal magic that they get from being with their mothers longer that helps them be a better mother. And in our herd, you will find familial family groups of daughters, mothers, aunts that will stick together. And they even will babysit for each other. Like if one is kidding and, you know, I've watched them do this and they all know each other. They know each other for years. They know each other forever. But that sounds amazing. Bernard will be right back. You know, it's, it's one of those days we have connection issues, but that's okay. He's very excited to answer all of your wonderful questions. Thank you for tuning in today. He will be right back. So, uh, to, yeah. to answer your question, I don't separate. Yeah, I don't separate my bucks because we're going again for the meat product. So, well, let me back up and say I separate them to prevent close inbreeding, and that's you know when they get about you know three months old, these guys are being trying their best to breed. So we'll separate them and put them in a different field across from their mothers. I uh, leave the dolings with them. But if I was doing milk, I would separate because I also have heard that it taints the flavor of the milk to have the bucks around. But I run my meat goats in what I call harems, and I will leave the buck in with the doe year round. So much easier to manage them that way. And then I rotate my bucks, and that way I, I can control my breeding by rotating the bucks. So the bucks will have you know, their, their harem, which is almost like a, a semi-permanent harem. But I, I might change it every two years or every three years, depending on where I want to go with my genetic selection. But it's much easier that way. You know, you, you can throw a buck in there with, you know, 20 to 30, 35 does. He's happy. They're happy. You know who's the father of all those babies. And then by simply opening up a gate and switching bucks, you don't have to do a whole lot more changing around. You know, you put a centralized water and housing makes it a whole lot easier to manage them. But um yeah, if, if I was doing milk, I would separate to answer your question. But I, I don't do the milk, so we don't have to. Thank you, I Scott. Also don't, Go ahead. I, I also do not castrate my bucklings, and I, I know a lot of people do, but I want that again. I want that increased growth rate. So by the time they're, you know, if they're 8 to 10 months old, they're going to be processed out in my system anyway, and then they're going to be in the freezer or they're going to go to the grill or somebody's going to be purchasing them, purchasing that product to eat. So, Scott, thank you for asking this great question. We're going to get to your next one as soon as Renard comes right back. Um, here you are. Yeah, I'm definitely plugged in, and I've got all these green lights flashing, and everything says, says okay, but it's cutting in and out. So, I'll give Verizon a call after I finish. <laughs> I want to know what's happening too. I know. I like it sounds like you have tested all of it and like it should all be working. Um, yeah, it's probably Verizon. In. Well, or we had a lot of rain recently and I'm wondering if there's uh, maybe moisture in the cable outside of my antenna, but awesome. I'll, I'll go out there and yeah, it, it's something simple. Sometimes, you know, one time I had a problem with an electric fence and it was a lizard that had gotten up there and shorted it out. You oh, know, no. stuff like that happens sometime. Yeah, a sure. lizard had shorted it out. And I'm, he was totally fried up in the box, but, you know, I was wondering why the goats were, like, walking through it like it wasn't on. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't it was on. A, it was a fried lizard in the, in the charger. <laughs> it shorted out the box, you know. 
unplugged it, took the lizard out, and right back to work. Well, at least you figured it out. That's always good. Yeah. Farming requires you to figure stuff out all the time, right? It surely does. Yeah. Karina had one more question for you. She wanted sure. to know why myotonics are also called Tennessee fainting goats. You know, yeah. Uh, the myotonic breed is known by many names. Um, they were, according to the stories, they were basically got their start from some breeders in Tennessee when this gentleman came down from Nova Scotia, we believe. You know, it's a land race breed. Nobody really knows for sure, but that's the popular lore and that's how the story goes. So they took the name of Tennessee. Because that's where they were from. Um, Bernard will be right back. Yeah. Yeah, that's where they got their start in, in from the state of Tennessee. Um, there's basically a couple of lines in this country, actually more than a few now. But um, Tennessee and Texas were central in the development of the myotonic breed as we know it. Um, some were selected for more media quality. Some were selected for, you know, um, well, different qualities. They were slightly smaller. The Tennessee goats had a tendency to be smaller than the Texas um, goats. You know, I think that now there's those lines are pretty much crossed up because of breeder selection. And that process, we now have a mix of those of those lines and, and other homegrown lines. You know, we have a homegrown line that's really a blended line. You know, I got some old genetics from Dr. Spinberg, and then we've, you know, line bred them and uh, the way that we wanted them to go to create what we want to have here. But to answer your question, it's because uh, this gentleman by the name of Tinsley showed up in Tennessee. The ghost got started there. They had that myotonia congenita. They exhibited that fainting genetic, if you will, although they don't really faint. They just lock up. They do not faint. Um, and so that's why some are called Tennessee fainting goats. Some are called stiff-legged goats. Some are called, you know, myotonics. Some people have even come up with some new names for them. But such is the nature of a land race, you know, species. And we're dealing with a land race species. It's, it's an open population genetic that's always going to be constantly evolving, which is a good thing. But um, those of us who breed them true to type are going to Karina, thank you asking, for asking this great question. Uh, Renard will be right back. Yes, those, those of us who breed them true to type are going to breed to maintain the genetic standards that uh, are written in the myotonic goat registry. There are other registries, but that's another story too. I think that's all of our questions today. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about that maybe we didn't ask you? Wow. You know, I, I think that the most important thing for people to, if you're raising goats or if you aspire to raise goats, you must study them, become a student of goats, but become a student of nature. They are not as difficult to raise as people will make it out to be sometimes. They do great on forage. They need space, they need to be kept dry. Build your buildings with a south facing exposure on high ground so they don't stand in water. Make sure your north wall is solid so that you don't get prevailing north winds and have cold animals. Cold and wet are not good for goats. Other than that, you know, you fence them, give them a good mineral and provide a diverse forage base. They pretty much will make you a happy camper. Uh, I think they're incredible animals. They're good for the environment. They have that low carbon footprint feature. They will increase the value of your property. That I have witnessed, and, and it's amazing. You know, the vegetation. That Bernard will be right back. Thank you all for tuning in today. We appreciate all of your wonderful questions. and. The vegetation that we have here is largely due to the fact that we have goats, you know, browsing and walking all around. You know, generally I have a few in the front yard because we have a few that we call the usual suspects. And, you know, they, they manage to escape no matter what, but they're, you know, they're so tame. They're, they're just coming to the front yard and um, climb up in your uh, lounge chair, take a nap. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're very entertaining sometimes. Absolutely. Uh, I have chickens and I just watch them run around the backyard sometimes. <laughs> Call it <Yeah>. chicken TV. <laughs> uh, 
Well, they'll, they'll come in the house if you let them. You know, if you open the door or leave it open, they'll walk right in. I'm you know. sure they will. Um, and they probably want to see the video and watch TV with me, but we, we don't encourage that. <laughs> our, 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 our working goats are not pets. I mean, they really are. But um, they, they're enhancing our life and they're enhancing our, uh, our farm. And, and I see those as win-wins for all of us. And, and I do enjoy the genetics and, and breeding. Um, I, I get a real good kick out of that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing Dr. Phil Spannenberg again. I'm picking up my new buck this month. Yay. All right. That's exciting. Well, for another couple of generations. Fantastic. I'll weave it in and do some line breeding and keep it moving. That's super exciting. Are there any it good is. resources that people should be aware of that you found really helpful? Wow. That's a great question. Um, now I have to go back to my memory bank. Yeah, I, I, I read, I don't know how many thousands of hours on goats and stuff on the internet, oh, sure. you know, but I, I find, um, oh my goodness. Uh, I don't want to necessarily name supply companies because everybody can find those, but there's a bunch of resources on the internet about natural goat raising. So I would just say to you, research the natural goat raising and, and, and look at that. Be mindful of, of how you use chemical wormers. I, I, I'm not fond of them. Um, we. Bernard will be right back. Thank you again for tuning in today and being patient with us. We really appreciate it. Um, I hope you're enjoying this lovely Tuesday afternoon. Well, this has been testing a patience, hasn't it? <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> Yeah, you're doing a great job. Well, you know, and the thing is, you know, that I know I tested this you know, two days ago. And I think it was and everything's like, oh, your mic was working the picture. And I said, OK, it looks good. It works fine. No problem. All, all set to go. But Murphy is in of the house. <laughs> <laughs> so you were recommending so, people Googling uh, not raising goats naturally. Yeah, raising goats naturally, and there's there's several Facebook groups along those lines. Um, I, I, that is the way to go. That that is the way to go. Um, be mindful of overfeeding them, and especially on heavy concentrates. You know, I think anything above like a 12% protein in these rations, I think it's a waste of your money. I really do. Um, but you know, people have different needs. They some people want fat, slick goats because that's what they like. Um, I want my goats to be working goats that work in the field. And, you know, I would I'm not buying bags of feed anyway. So that's another lesson I learned. Forage is best. So Bernard will be right back with us. Thank you for hanging in there today. We really appreciate it. Um, there you are. Supplement it with some round or whatever. You know, it's it, your, your diet is going to have to be based on your locale, you know, where you live. You know, if you've got, you know, five or six months of snow and it's very cold, you're going to have to feed these animals differently. You're going to have to tend to them differently based on their needs. But um, I'm in I'm in central Virginia. We do have a winter. Sometimes it's harsh. Sometimes it's not. But generally, it's pretty moderate. So I don't have um, I mean, nine months out of the year, I can raise these goats on 100 percent forage without a problem. Three months out of the year, I might have to supplement and I have no problem doing that. But I would look for um a a not a grain based food stuff to supplement them and minimize i minimize the use of any grain product because i, I just they're not meant to really digest that stuff well they'll do okay but you know it's like people we eat a lot of stuff we shouldn't but they'll, they'll survive but it's not it's just not best for them and it's not best for the pocket of the, the producer either you know sure. I, i'm I had a person who called me and she told me, unfortunately, that she, her husband had passed and she had inherited a herd of, of meat goats. She didn't know anything about them because she. Bernard will be right back. But if you have more questions for him later, please check out his Facebook page and send him a message. Um, she was overfeeding them. So when I asked her, you know, she said she's uh, goats dying every day. And I'm like, well, that shouldn't be happening. And so when I questioned what she was feeding, she was feeding 50 pounds of feed to five goats a day. Oh, wow. I'm like, yeah, that's what I said. Well, that's not a good thing to be doing, ma'am. And she goes, well, 
do you think I'm feeding too much? And I said, absolutely, you are. And they're dying. She says, well, they never come out the barn. And well, they can't. You, you got them locked up and you're feeding them 50 pounds of feed, 16% ration, killing them. But um, so be mindful. I think over 12% is probably a waste of money. But I like forage. Goats do great on forage. They sure do. Yeah. So they, they never see me buying bags of feed at the feed store. Bernard will be right back. Uh, yes, please check out his Facebook page. Check out his website. We really appreciate him being a part of Goat Chats today. I would I would say the advantages of my tonics are that they're easy keepers, um, generally great mothers. Um, they don't have a tendency to jump and climb fences, although they will just like any other goat escape if they can. But it's less a rubber problem. And if you get a good hot fence wire, I have seen them kept in with one single strand of electric. But, you know, it can be done. I personally would use more than that. Um, but they're easy keepers. They're thrifty. They are deserving of our preservation efforts because it's a uniquely North American land race breed. And it gives us as breeders really a, a wide berth to, to, to breed within and still conform to an acceptable standard for the breed. They're, they're just thrifty goats. And, and I like that. I don't want an animal that's going to make me work harder than I have to. And I find that my atonics fit that niche for me just fine. I, I, they don't make me work harder. That's a good thing. Absolutely. Work smarter, not harder. Yeah. And I don't know why this thing was doing that. I apologize for this, Brittany, because I, you know, I logged in and it was working great. Now it seems to be going for a longer period of time, but, you know, imagine that. And the sun's up more. Maybe it's warmed up something outside on my. It's entirely possible. And that's okay. You know, technology happens and that's absolutely okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead. I'm getting pretty quick with this mouse. You're a pro. It's like pro status right now. Well, I'm going to say thank you for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. You brought so much wonderful knowledge to the goat chats today and I hope people enjoyed it. Um, I hope so too. And, you know, I thank you again for this opportunity. I, I like the livestock conservancy. Um, you know, I'm joining as a board member this month. I don't know if you know or not, but you probably do. Well, and I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah. Um, and, and I hope that we'll be able to encourage some other small family farms and maybe not so small family farms to give my atonic goes a try. Um, Absolutely. You know, goat meat is still the most widely eaten red meat on the planet Earth. Uh, that's not going to change anytime soon. And uh, with global warming on the rise, it's probably going to increase because it, the inputs are much less for raising these goats. And you can raise more animals in a smaller space with a lower carbon footprint. And that's good for the planet. Absolutely. So. They are wonderful goats. Oops. I don't know what happened. There you are. Yes. Well, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Please check out Renard's Facebook and website um, and learn more about raising goats sustainably and naturally. I hope everyone will tune back in next week. We are going to talk about St. Clemente Island goats. All right. Have a wonderful afternoon.